Write this stuff down. Virtue is defined as behavior showing high moral standards. A quality considered morally good or desirable in a person. In fact, virtue can actually also be tied to virginity or chastity. You know, actually how the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 31, who can find a what? A virtuous, a virtuous woman for a price is what? Far above proof. Now get what the Bible is saying there in, in Proverbs chapter 31 when it says that. What it's saying is, is that virtue in a woman and also in a man is very, very rare. There are very... If you find a virtuous person, you will find a gold mine. And you better not let that person go. I, I, I've talked to the, I know I talked to this one particular person. And, uh, and the person's single. Older person. And I won't say who, where, what, when, or why. But they want a good wife. And they said, I want a wife that you know has a, all this particular shape, da 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 da. Oh, okay. You know, what, you know what that same the chapter says? It says, uh, beauty is vain and favor is deceitful, but one that fears the Lord. That, that's the type of woman you should be looking for. Amen. And I'm not trying to say you need to, you know, because I think if, you, if, a, if a woman's godly, she's going to try her, all her best to take care of herself. Amen? She's going to wash your face. She's going she's to take good care of herself. And if you're not doing those things, I'm starting to question your relationship with God, you know. I love the Lord with yellow teeth. Come on, sister. <laughs> I, yell, I love the Lord. You got all the sleep still in your eye. Come on, wipe the sleep out of your eye. Now, Mark, can I get an amen? amen? I love the Lord, but you know, but I, but I, but at the same time, what I'm saying to you, friends, is if you can find a good, I'm talking to the men, and it also for the, I'll talk back to I'll talk to the ladies. I'll talk to the men after I talk to the ladies. If you can find a woman of character. A woman who loves Jesus and holds a high standard, and she's not going to come down off of that for you or anybody else, you have found yourself a jewel. And those things are hard to come by. You know, I mean, because you have a whole lot of, you know, pretty women or you've got a whole lot of handsome men, but these people don't have no standards at all. Right now. And they'll go for anything and everything. And I'm going to talk to the young people, and I want to say to you all, you all don't sell yourself short when it comes to who you choose and how you actually treat, treat your own selves. Hold your own selves to a high standard. Amen? Because when you hold yourself to a high standard, what you're going to be doing is, is you're pushing away people who are, too, who are actually intimidated by you being on that standard. Certain people, they, they don't want to, they want an easy woman. There's certain men who, can I just be honest with you all? They want an easy woman. A woman that they can, you know, and you know what's so sad? You know what's so sad is that there are many men who even prey on church women because some of the church women are not as virtuous as we actually thought. And many times they're just as easy, according to what Ellen White just said, many times they're just as easy as the women of the world. And it's the same thing for many men. Men, you cannot just hold yourself to this low standard. Hold your own standard high. Quit settling and quit settling in your own selves to say, you know what, I'm just going to do what I want to do anytime. How I, because, friends, guess what? When you get that venereal disease, forgive me for being, I'm trying to just be straight with you. When you get that venereal disease, you think the women are going to want to still be with you? I don't think so. When you get that, when you get three or four babies, now there might be some crazy woman, you know, I'm not trying to, I want to sound because maybe the Lord's telling you, but when you, got, when you got those five children by five different women, there many, many women are going to go, I don't want to mess with you no more. And it's really bad, I hate to say it, for the young ladies. When those young ladies got three, four children by several different men, the men are not going to try to actually say, can I marry you? I'm just being real. So you got to actually make a decision in your mind. You know what? I am going to be what? Virtuous. And don't, and don't beat yourself up over the head over the, over the mistakes of the past. Amen? Because Amen. all have what? Sin. And come, I don't want to sound too harsh. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you've got to actually say to yourself, you know what? I am going to set my standard high. What I like about Daniel, and I'm just being real with you. Daniel in chapter 1, he said, he purposed in his heart. He wasn't going to what? Defile himself. And you've got to make a decision of your mind. I am not going to mess my life up. Amen? So here's the 
word virtue. So the virtue, the word virtue actually can mean all those things. It's interesting because the word virtue actually comes from a Latin word verb, which means man. And what it's saying is, is that a, a, a virtuous person is mature. They're not a kid. They are what? A man. Remember, it's the same thing applies to a woman. They're a woman. They are mature. They make decisions after thinking. They don't just do the first thing that pops into their brain. They think about what they're going to do. Amen? Amen. Interestingly enough, though, also, turn with me in your Bible. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 19. I hope you're taking notes. Luke chapter 6, verse number 19. Luke chapter 6, verse 19. Because I want you to see what the word virtue also means. Luke chapter 6, verse 19. And I think this is powerful because this, this hit me. Luke chapter 6, <coughs> verse number 19. Same matter if you're there. Amen. The Bible says, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went what out of him? Virtue out of him, and healed them all. Now what the word virtue there actually could actually mean was, is that he had inherent power. Which means, what that suggests is, is that when you are living a virtuous life, you have inherent power. <coughs> You know when a person is actually living a, a righteous life, they have a certain amount of, uh, of just power about them. There's a certain type of nobility and power about that person who's, got, who's living a, a virtuous life. And why? It's because the Spirit of God can dwell in you that much more richly when you're living a righteous life. Yes, the Bible says in John chapter 3 about Jesus, it says that the Spirit was not by measure given to Jesus. The Father loves the Son. He gives all things into His hand. Why did He give so much of the Spirit of God to His Son? It's because His Son had lived a what? A perfect life. And the more your life is holy, the more the Spirit of God can dwell inside of you so the power of God can be manifested through you. So the Spirit of God is trying to get us to live a holy life so He can live in us more richly. <laughs> the devil's trying to keep the Spirit of God from living inside of you. So here's the next question. Are there some examples of, of men and women who lived a virtuous or holy lives? Absolutely. We know of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews that he lived a holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners type of life. There was never a time, and this is powerful, friends, not even by a thought did Jesus commit a sin. Now, I don't want to actually, if the Lord were to expose my thoughts. <laughs> Lord, don't expose my thoughts. <laughs> Because I know actually that sometimes my thoughts have not been holy. So here's the question. Here's the question because we're about to get to the good nitty gritty. What constitutes a virtuous life or a life of high moral standards? Go with me to, look to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and verse 14. Ecclesiastes the 12th chapter, verse 13 and verse 14. What constitutes, and somebody read that for me, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and verse 14. What constitutes a virtuous life? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and verse 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret. Okay, so get this. A virtuous life is a life in harmony with all of God's commandments. That means that you're living a life that is that is totally, you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't bear false witness, you keep the Sabbath, you keep all the ten of God's commandments. Now, now, this is what we know of in the Bible. Matthew chapter 19, the Bible says this rich young ruler, I'm moving quick. He came to Jesus, and, and Jesus said, and he said to Jesus, Good Master, what must, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? He said, Keep the commandments. And what did that rich young ruler say? He says, All these have I kept from my what? Youth up. What lack I yet? Which meant in his own eyes, he thought he was living a virtuous life. But now, here's where Jesus put a wrench into the whole idea of keeping God's commandments. Turn with me to the Bibles to Romans chapter Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven. We're going. We're looking at a whole lot of scripture here. Romans the seventh chapter, and I want you to see what the Bible says in verse number fourteen, because this is the wrench 
that is put in our understanding of Sabbath keeping or, or in our understanding of keeping God's commandments. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 14. Romans chapter 7 verse 14. And somebody else read that one for me. Romans 7 verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold on the sin. Now did you get that? The law is spiritual, I'm carnal, sold under sin, which means that I'm actually living in the what? In the flesh. Which means that as much as I keep the law outwardly, in the eyes of God, it may not be keeping it what? Inwardly. In fact, the Bible says, in Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately what? Wicked. Who can what? Who can know it? Which means I can be keeping the Sabbath outwardly, but at the same time in my heart, I'm not keeping it at all. I can be keeping, I can be abstaining from adultery, but in my heart, I can be committing adultery constantly. I could be actually abstaining from killing somebody, but at the same time, I got some hate in my heart, and in the eyes of God, I'm as bad a serial killer as some of those people who are in the prison that we're going to be visiting on this coming Friday. I could be actually that person who honors my parents outwardly, but at the same time, I'm doing it grudgingly, and they get on my last nerves, and I really, really want to be doing something else other than hanging out with my parents. And in the eyes of God, God's not looking at your actions. God is looking at your heart. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Jesus had, excuse me, God had to say to, to Sammy, he says, look not upon his countenance or on the height of his stature, because man doesn't see as God sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. God's looking at what's going on inside of your heart. Yeah. And in the hearts of many a person, friends, we are as far from God as the, as the east is from the west. So what constitutes a real moral life in the eyes of God is a, it, it, it is a person whose heart, get this, write this down, is right with God. Because as the heart goes, so ultimately will go the body. The Bible says, where your treasures, there will your heart be also. If, if your heart is the place, in, in, in a particular place, that's where you're going. You know what, friends? Uh, you know, some people's heart is on their jobs. So then, because their heart is on their job, if their employer says you have to work on the Sabbath, they're going to work on the Sabbath. Some people's heart, some people's heart is with their boyfriend or with their girlfriend. So then. Uh, when their boyfriend or girlfriend wants them to be with them, they'll be willing to put everything aside to be with that particular what? That particular person. Where is your heart? That's a big question. It's not where is your body. Where is your what? Your heart. So what constitutes a virtuous life, a life in the sight of God is a one where the, where the heart is right with God. But now here's the question. How does that relate to faith? How in the world do I get a heart that's right with God? Well, you can't get it by your own actions. And this is, the, this is what's called righteousness by faith. There's nothing that you or I can do to actually transform our hearts. But what we can do is we can ask for God to give us a, a completely new heart. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel the 36th chapter. Ezekiel chapter 36. And we'll look at the Bible says in verse number 26. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse number 26. Ezekiel 36 verse 26. And we're going to go through verse number 27. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 and 27. Say amen if you're there. It says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the what? The stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of what? Flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my what? My judgments and do them. You see, of yourself, you and I cannot keep God's commandments. But when we ask for Christ to give us a new heart, friends, then after he gives us a new heart and a new mind and a new desire and a new will, friends, all of a sudden the things that we once hated, now we 
start to love, the places that we once hated to go, now we want to go, and those places that we used to love to go to, now we cannot stand. You actually, I never will forget hearing this particular preacher talk about how this, how their, uh, how Dwight Moody, Dwight Moody was asked. He said, "Hey, Dwight Moody, you're a Christian. You can't go gambling. You can't do. You can't gamble." And you know what Dwight Moody told him? He said, yes, I can gamble. And he was in shock. He said, but I don't want to gamble anymore. Why? Because God has given me a new heart. And you see, when God gives you a new heart, friends, you don't even have a desire to do the things that you used to want to do, friends. So out of nowhere, you start loving things that you used to hate before. You enjoy coming to church. Amen. You know, I've seen there are certain people in church, they enjoy church. Why? Because they're in love with Jesus. And, they, and they're like David who says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord because he's good. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And they can say like they can say like David, enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. In fact, you got to pull them away from church. Because they're so injured. They enjoy the presence of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I can tell you, you know, you can kind of tell who's in love with them, friends. Because friends, they lift their hands at the smallest thing. You're like, put your hands down. They shout when there's no reason to shout, friends. They say hallelujah when there's no reason to say hallelujah, friends. Because they're in love with Jesus inside their hearts. He's got their heart, friends. That's what God says to people. He says, give me thine heart. Because if, if you give him his heart, your heart, friends, then all of a sudden he can give you that virtuous life that you will not have otherwise. Oh, thank you.